Coming up next, the fastest GPU this week, building a NAS, don't fear WD Green's iPads for arthritis and silent gaming. Coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 95, recorded November 11th, 2010. The fastest GPU this week. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the AARP Auto Insurance Program from the Hartford. Discover great rates, benefits, and service specifically designed for AARP members at aarp.thehartford.com slash podcast. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, the man, the myth himself. You're looking, oh, come on, pull Ryan back up. Where are you? There he is, Ryan Trout, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, pcper.com hardware Hi Patrick, how are legend. You? I'm I'm excited. My networking issues have been resolved. My Skype has been reinstalled. My camera is working, and, and I can actually see you, and you can see me. And John's not in the background, going, "Where did the video go?" So this is very exciting <laughs> for me. So hey, any, cross your fingers. Anytime we can get, uh, you know, as much <laughs> as we love computers and technology, we always. I mean, I guess it's kind of like that law of how many times you try to use something is is how often you're going to see these types of hiccups. But <laughs> I'll tell you what, if every time. Uh, we had problems with Skype as, as often as we have problems with Skype and, and networks and stuff. If I was, was trying to get my mom or dad to use it, I might think twice, but they seem to have a lot less trouble than I do. So maybe that's, that's yeah. Something. But they're also not trying to do it to a standard. There's kind of a difference between having a conversation being like, I am a techno professional and I am creating a video podcast on the internet. Cause then the <laughs> pressure's up, man. <laughs> that's true. That is true. That's very true. So, I, we should probably fire out the, the, the big story, NVIDIA GeForce DTX 580, one and a half gigabytes of memory on that beastie, and you did SLI testing over at PC Per. Yeah, so this is kind of like the new king of the, of the hill in terms of single GPU performance now. Um, the Fastest the GTX GPU ever <laughs> for six ever, months. Ever today, right? <laughs> probably less than that, let's be honest. Um, so the, <laughs> this is a GTX 580. The, they, they actually look almost identical to the GTX 480, which mm -hmm. I also have here as well. They're both large cards. Um, but what's interesting, I from a physical standpoint, the, the new 580 is actually a, a physically lighter card. It uses a vapor chamber cooler as opposed to a massive uh, heat pipe, um, George Foreman grill style cooler. Well, what's the, what's the what exactly is going on with a vapor chamber cooler? Because I mean, when you think about it, the 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 more traditional coolers on there are essentially using liquid that vaporizes, or at least in theory, to transmit yeah. the heat to the to the outer heat sink and away from the CPU. What, that's, exactly, what, that's, that's exactly what it's doing. I mean, it's essentially uh, a rotating system with two wicks that that pulls. There's a liquid in there that, as it heats, it it it. Um, it condenses, not condenses, the opposite of that. It vaporizes into uh, gas. It, that takes the heat away. It spreads it over a larger area. Um, and then as that uh, air cools, it then condenses back down into liquid and, and it picks up more heat from the GPU and it kind of cycles it. What that allows it to do in this form factor, I don't have this one open, but the heat sink might take up, um, you know, this whole portion of, of the of the graphics card and it can spread out heat mm. very efficiently very quickly to all of the fins yeah. the, the the aluminum cooling fins on there whereas nice. on the 480 it was really just one huge heat sink with uh, mm -hmm. uh, heat pipes kind of taking it to different areas of the heat sink as quickly as it could um, so it's it's more efficient it is it's more efficient that it's just more expensive so they, they were able, basically, they said, well, we needed it to keep it at a certain thermal level, TDP level. Um, mm -hmm. So what they just needed to go for the vapor chamber this way. It also allows them uh, to run the fan. If it's more efficient cooling, they can run the fan a little bit lower speed and they're down, uh, therefore cut down on noise, which is one of the big complaints about the GTX 480 and 470 was that it was hot and it was loud. Extremely and loud. And improves on both of those. By a, by, a, by a pretty good margin. Um, probably not still as quiet as like the, the 5,000 series of cards from AMD, 
but much, much quieter than the 480s and 470s. Um, so how much faster is it? So than... the, a, a 580 is, a, it's a new GPU based on the was the GF100, the new GTX 580's GF110, and the difference between there is we went from 480 processing cores on the GTX 480 to 512 processing cores on the GTX 580. Uh, wow. They, they also run a little bit faster clock speed, and the memory runs a little bit faster as well, and there have been uh, a couple of minor architectural shifts, like basically while they were, while they were in there re- uh, Re reorganizing transistors and stuff like that. They also tweaked a couple of things that they noticed that they could get done easily and quickly. I'd say overall performance is probably anywhere from 15 to 30 percent improvement over the 480, uh, from going mm -hmm. from the 480 to 580. But the, the kind of one of the keys here is that it's at the same TDP, so that you're, you're going to see a, a much improved performance per watt. Which also kind of translates into performance per decibel, I guess, if you if you want to make up a new metric as well. I mean, so it's going to be quieter and cooler um, mm -hmm. at the same temperature or the same thermal levels and that kind of thing. And, and then you get a performance boost on top of it. So this is kind of, a lot of people have said it, and I, and I tend to agree, this is what Fermi, the, the GTX... 400 series of cards was probably supposed to be. This is what NVIDIA wanted it to be. Because the GTX 480, even though it only has four, it has 480 cores it, on it uh, activated, they're actually, the GPU itself has 512 processing cores. But they had to disable a portion of them in order to reach thermal limits and uh, <laughs> yield limits, right? So this, right. this redesign basically allowed them to get the full performance out of the, out of the GPU uh, that they had originally planned to. So, I mean, it's the same 40 nanometer process technology. It's the same 3 billion transistor uh, GPU on there. So, I mean, it's it's still a beast of a card, right? And it, it draws almost right. identical power, but it, you get better performance out of it. Um, so, it's... it's is it, is it scaling ahead. on SLI like we've seen some of the other cards where we're actually getting a, a like 100% improvement or is it more the traditional SLI 30, 25, 20, 40% improvement? So it does really, really well in scaling when it can. And what I mean by that is when you start getting this much performance, it's, you get into CPU-limited uh, scenarios very easily. So Metro 2033, for example, goes from 29 to 52 frames a second. So that's really, really good. We're talking about 80% um, scaling going from a single card to a dual cards. So that's, that's pretty good. Lost Planet 2, I think we see something very similar to that. Uh, we go from 36 to 63. So again, really, really good scaling there. But some of these games, if we look at uh, F1 2010, for example, which is uh, a new racing game, if we look at scaling there, it actually, well, it actually does, it does decent from 50 to 90. Uh, Left 4 Dead 2 is one of those games where all of these cards perform so well that it it's really doesn't make any sense to have SLI here. I mean, you're going from 120 frames to 190 frames per second on average. I think your 120 is still going to be fine uh, in that regard. Uh, Civ 5 is another one that tends to be CPU limited as well. Uh, Bad Company 2, I think that one actually scaled pretty well. Yeah, from 47 to 89. So, yeah, I mean, we're still seeing good, good scaling numbers. It's a matter of um, what resolution are you playing at that that, that scaling becomes... You know, is it really worth it? I mean, if you're hitting, if you're playing on a 19 by 12 display, a single GTX 580 <laughs> will get you 80 frames a second right. uh, at, you know, on Bad Company 2 with all these image quality settings turned up. And that's, you know, that's kind of 80 frames per second sounds like a lot, but I'd say that's kind of like where you want to be to be super comfortable that sure. you're not going to drop below 60 very often type of thing. <laughs> um, so a pair of them is really 30 inch monitor and, and you know, you're planning for the future as well. But if I'm I'm doing a, you know, if I, I'm sitting here with my giant flight simulator powering nine monitors at full resolution, then suddenly <laughs> multiple cards start seem, start actually seeming, start actually seeming, yeah, dear, well, yeah. you're right. Uh, well, okay, so $500 cards, $1,000 for SLI, the people who are going to buy these cards, you know who you are, 15-30% um, improvement. I was kind of stoked about the OCZ Revo drive, 240 gigabytes, the PCI Express uh, SSD, but it's really not bringing the price down, or was that just my confusion? 
Um, it's not, no, it's not really bringing the price down uh, dramatically compared to other high-end SSDs or other PCI Express SSDs, but it, it, is, it, is, it is definitely really, really fast. It, it's competitive in, in terms of cost per gigabyte, um, comparing it to SSDs. Right. The typical Compared SATA, to the SATA connected. Yeah, the SATA connector drives. It's competitive, but it's not like it's not like going to a PCI Express adapter is going to drop the price per gigabyte no. compared to no, an but SSD. What it, it doesn't drop the price, but what is uh, kind of impressive about what OCZ has done with these with these drives is that it hasn't raised uh, the price either. Because if you look at other competitive PCI Express based solid state drives, they tend to be much much more expensive than your traditional SATA connected. PCI right. Express drives, and they are keeping that price down, right? So you can get a 160 gig uh, PCI Express based Revo drive X2 for $569, which is like $3.50 per gigabyte. You know, uh, that's, that's MSRP. We expect to see it a little bit lower than that in the next few weeks or so. But that's, that's expensive, but it's not outside the realm of what other SSDs are, are going to cost you. But these are much, 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 much faster than your traditional solid state drive. I mean, we're talking, um, let's see, where are our, our, our burst speeds here? We're talking, you know, 480 megabytes per second burst speed on these, uh, well exceeding what we've been able to see or get out of um, even SATA 6.0, that type of stuff. That's pretty fast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, we're looking at 600 sustained reads and writes at like 600, 700 megs per second. Wow. Depending on the application and stuff like that. I mean, these are the benefits you get with a PCI Express-based drive that, you know, are kind of lost uh, when you're trying to push this much data through a SATA cable, unfortunately. Is, is it essentially the SATA overhead that's killing performance compared to the PCI Express drives? I don't know if I would call it overhead. It's not like there's CPU overhead that, that needs to be processed mm -hmm. for it. It's just, it's just a data connection that was built for a different style of technology right it right. just it, i don't think it was you know they have plans for sata 4 and sata 5 you know coming down the pipe it's just mm -hmm. a matter of how quickly are they going to get them implemented and is there going to be other yeah. are there going to be other things that kind of replace it I mean, it's, go ahead i was going to say it's also amazing looking at the cpu utilization on the hd tac numbers like the the okay the x2 240 gigabyte revo drive you know is 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 considerably lower than even uh, Intel's X25 or the OCC Vertex drives, um, yep. which was kind of like, wow. And then what are the IO Extreme drives? Because those are looking like f four times as, as those, those are kind of like absorbing like four times as much bandwidth compared to the other drives on that test. Those are um, the mm -hmm. like enterprise grade PCI Express SSDs uh. as well. Okay. Uh, so we're talking really, really, really high. Uh, let's see. The IO Extreme, it was really, really hard to find, and it was $11 mm -hmm. per gigabyte. Okay. Uh, and then the IO Drive 160 was actually coming in at $40 per gigabyte. Right. So these are still also looking at like 1% to 3% total CPU utilization, or basically, you know, a chunk of a single core. Right. Um, right. Right. And these are still expensive. And if you want to get really expensive, uh, they mm -hmm. actually, OCZ is offering, they have a 960 gigabyte version of this card uh, for sale oh, wow. for about $3,400 or so. Um, $3.50 per gigabyte, so you get the same per gigabyte <laughs> price. Just a matter if you really want that almost one terabyte of really, really fast solid state drives. I, for, for me, that sweet spot is kind of like... Uh, the 160 gig drive. That's kind of what mm -hmm. I'm used to having for an SSD for a bootable partition anyway. About the same price as, as a good quality 160 gig SSD, but you get uh, much improved latency, much improved uh, bandwidth on those. And I think they're actually they're available today. Like I think I saw them, they were for sale on Newegg as of today. Uh, a couple mm -hmm. of them were already out of stock. I think maybe the 160 gig was out of stock, but it'll be curious to see how many people actually start to implement these um, because they just... You know, you just don't think of plugging your storage into a, into a PCI Express slot. It just it seems still kind of odd. It seems kind of like f either future technology or ancient technology, depending on which way you want to think about it. Um, right. 
Well, not that many people actually, I mean, you know, not that many people actually build their own systems, you know, compared to the number of people who buy computers every year, it's still a small percentage that actually upgrade their systems or, or build their systems from scratch. But I mean, I think it's interesting where you're looking at, you know, something that would have been a kind of a stone age technology. I mean, I was buying XL hard cards back in 1990, like 25, 50 megabyte hard cards um, to go into ISA slots <laughs> on computers back then. And, right. and it's, you know, other than a, a couple of experiments using um, volatile flash RAM uh, or using volatile RAM to create flash drives, um, there really hasn't been a whole lot of anything that's even remotely affordable for consumers until this last kick on the on the SSD drives. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got to say, I'm a little disappointed, like, you know, X25M, you know, the 80 gigabyte versus down to $190, um, Corsair 60 byte, gigabyte for 130. It's it's not, I was kind of expecting more capacity for less money by the end of this year. You know, people are looking at like yeah. double the capacity or half the price. Um, and I guess like, I take that back. I've got a 40 gigabyte XL, or I've got a 40 gigabyte X25N that I paid about 250 bucks for. So I guess, two, you know, less than 200 for 80 gigabytes would probably be double the capacity. Um, it's just I keep hearing about all these 240, 320 gigabyte cards, and I'm like, right. I, want, I want the bigger flash drive. I, I will mm. agree with you that I think uh, price, prices per, price per gig, <laughs> I feel like it should have decreased more than it has over the last year, uh, especially considering Intel. Intel's kind of been, I don't know if they're delaying it or if they're having problems with it. They're 22 mm. nanometer flash-based SSDs. Um, you know, once, once those are out the door, there's no... You know, excuse other than let's keep these profit margins as high as possible to keep prices, uh, price per gig at where they're at. So, is OCZ your favorite brand at this point for SSD drives? Um, they're one of the favorites. I still, I still really like the Intel drives. Um, I, I'm still a fan of those. I have those in a lot in a lot of machines. Hmm. OCZ is one of the few companies that does more than just regurgitate chipsets. You know, sure. they 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 try to uh, help develop their own. Uh, uh, firmwares and try to, you know, they, they have a, a huge array of different technology options. They're always trying new things, which can be good, can be bad, but uh, <laughs> for a small company, they're innovating and they're trying to open up these new markets. You know, if, if OCZ wasn't doing these PCI Express based solid state drives, will we even have access to them at this point is, is, is a really, I think, uh, a valid question. So... Good to know. All right. We don't talk about Facebook much. Well, we don't, I don't think we've ever actually talked about Facebook. Um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we haven't, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you've never checked it out, there's a website called datacenterknowledge.com, which talks about giant data centers, these big facilities that people like Facebook and Google um, create. And it's kind of interesting. I thought if, if you're kind of curious about serious hardware installations, um, Facebook just built one in Oregon. They're now building one in North Carolina. They're going to spend about $450 million, about 150 acres. And wow. they're going to build a 300 square foot, 300,000 square foot data, a 300 square foot data center about the size <laughs> of your bathroom. Um, a 300,000 square foot data center. Um, it's going to take 18 months to build. And what's crazy is when you realize there's going to be thousands of machines inside this building, it's only going to take about 40 full-time and part-time contract workers to run it. But the thing I thought was really interesting is looking at the cooling that they're playing around with because one of the biggest expenses on data center after electricity is cooling because these these systems all of these systems howling away inside a data center generate a huge amount of heat and uh, facebook's been playing around with uh, in their prineville oregon data center they've been using evaporative cooling instead of a chiller system which reduces the amount of electricity it uses that's one of the big movements in these giant data centers um, and then recycling the heat from the servers to heat the facility in the winter but i also thought it was really interesting it's like the Prineville design forgoes, and this is a quote from the article, traditional uninterruptible power supplies and power distribution units and adds a 12-volt battery to each server power supply. So basically, <laughs> they're hot wiring in a 12-volt battery. And it's kind of funny, like Google uh, did a huge article talking about consumer drive reliability because it turns out Google is, is, is scaling on such ridiculous level and building so many server boxes and so many data centers. It was just fiscally ridiculous to use uh, you know enterprise or or raid style hard drives they, they use consumer right. grade hard drives which led them to write some interesting um, papers on the failure yeah. rates on consumer hard drives and how it relates to smart data so if you want to get your nerd on I highly recommend checking that one out and then uh, the AMD APU Zakate you're gonna have that in at PC per next week right 
Yeah, if, if we have a little bit of a preview at the at PCPro.com this week, but it's more kind of an architectural overview. We didn't, we weren't allowed to post numbers, but AMD had me down in Austin last week, uh, actually last Wednesday, and I got some hands-on time with the first, the, the what's going to be the first released AMD APU, uh, it, uh, which is the accelerated processing unit, accelerated processing unit, the CPU GPU combination part, uh, and by this time next week we'll have had an article posted that looks at performance and power consumption mm. of it compared to the, you know, the newest Atom processors, Intel CULV, things in that type of netbook, low-cost notebook uh, realm. And I think the numbers are going to be pretty impressive. We'll talk about that next week as well. Cool. But I want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up to start thinking low power as well, <laughs> not just, not, not just the, the, this. I mean, I think, let's see, for an example, you can get 10 complete systems running... Uh, on this APU, on these AMD APUs, for the power draw you get out of this graphics card. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. As I was yeah. pointing out, uh, we finally got our boxy box in here. Uh, our mm -hmm. first one actually disappeared to Monaco, and I won't talk about that, but uh, we'll have a full review of the boxy box, which turns out to be a, 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 a Intel Atom powered machine. We talked mm -hmm. about Tegra losing the uh, boxy box earlier this year, but we'll talk about the uh, implementation on this and how it works with 1080p video next week cool. on uh, Techzilla and HD Nation and cool. uh, the unbelievably bizarre. Uh, case <laughs> that that comes in. It's very cool. I, I still, I'm still a fan of that. Uh, let, before we get into I, emails, let's it's take growing a quick on second. me a lot. I, I think, I think it's just unique enough. It's not really convenient for uh, you know putting in a in a shelf somewhere, but yeah, we can go for that next week too. Uh, but before we get into our emails for the week, wanted to go ahead and uh, thank this week's sponsor of this week in computer hardware. AARP Auto Insurance Program from the Hartford. For our, for our audience members over the age of 50, the AARP Auto Insurance Program from the Hartford can save you as much as $384 on auto insurance. More than 3 million AARP members who are already enjoying the benefits of this program. Uh, benefits that include lifetime renewability, lifetime repair guarantee, and a six-point claim guarantee. Customers, current customers, describe the claims experience as, quote, fast, Easy and outstanding. When's the last time you've heard that from car insurance companies? Check them out today <laughs> and get an eight-minute quote. Go to aarp.thehartford.com slash podcast. That's aarp.thehartford.com slash podcast. And we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. We say we jump into a couple of uh, emails we got here this week. I am totally ready for emails. Uh, Dr. Jim Beam has a question about wireless audio. Uh, no whiskey humor allowed at this <laughs> moment. He says, I got a boring question for you. I'll understand if you ignore it. I'm looking for a way. There are no boring questions, just boring answers. Looking for a way to wirelessly stream analog stereo music from one device to another. Distance is about 12 feet. Any suggestions? Trying to get music channels from my cable box to my little bookshelf stereo system. Looking for something cheap and simple and cheap, like less than $50 if possible. Um, Less than 50 bucks is tough, right? Because so many yeah. devices that are available today uh, are either Bluetooth based, which sounds like ass, and I highly recommend you avoid Bluetooth stereo audio. Uh, mm -hmm. Or more importantly, almost all of them are either USB audio based or designed to plug an iPod into. Um, you know, uh, EOS Convergence or EOS, EOS Convergence um, does a pretty good. Uh, uh, excuse me, EOSWireless.com is the website, uh, but their Converge um, is 100 bucks for the transmitter and 100 bucks for the receiver, which is four Ooh. times what uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Jim Beam wants to spend. Um, something a little closer to his range is Rocketfish, does, uh, which is a house brand for Best Buy, does the mm -hmm. universal wireless rear speaker kit. It's 110 bucks. I've seen them for sale used on uh, eBay and, and the Yahoo Marketplace for as little as 60 mm -hmm. bucks uh, or maybe refurbished. And it does CD quality audio, which I think is fine if you're going from cable, you know, cable audio isn't the best, um, to a boom box. Uh, basically, CD quality audio on, on the open 2.4 gigahertz uh, range. The only downside is is if you turn off the source before you turn off your receiver, you're probably going to hear a buzz or sort of an annoying kind of hum or buzz on the channel because some people mm. are saying it's pretty noisy if it doesn't have an input source. 
but I, you know, I'd be curious. There's there's lots of devices designed to do USB wireless audio from a computer or a notebook, um, but actually taking an analog source and spitting an analog source out, uh, analog input, analog output is a little more difficult. But I'm going to say the Rocketfish Universe Wireless uh, Universal Wireless Speaker Kit is probably going to be one of the easiest ones to find. Um, because that's the other problem is a lot of stuff is was out there a few years ago, um, but it's very difficult to actually find one for sale. In a lot of cases, they were doing some unbelievably nasty front side compression of the audio um, before sending it to the receiver, and you end up with this horrendous <laughs> audio quality situation. Yeah, nobody wants that. That's a good idea, though. I didn't think anything for that close to that price is going to be tough. $110 is yeah. not too bad. It's, um, it's, you know, I mean, but the problem is at 12 feet, like, boy, you know, can you run the, a wire under the cable <laughs> or under the yeah, carpet, not cable? I'm, can you run a cable under the carpet? Because um, 12 yeah, feet is like so close, so close and yet so far. You it's talk, always the last 12 feet. You, you talk to uh, uh, Alvin uh, uh, Malventano, who's the storage yes. editor for PC Perspective. We had a, a user commenting on that basically the world was going to disintegrate if people used uh, Western Digital green drives or black drives and servers because Western Digital themselves says only their RAID drives can be used for NAS boxes and, and everything's going to fall apart. And I, I read that that question, that answer, that viewer response with great trepidation. But Western Digital does say, uh, so, you know, TLER, the, 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 the time limit error recovery, basically, they, they would give you, you could download a tool, turn it on, and for primarily hardware RAID controllers, it would prevent the hard drive from going into deep recovery mode, which would oftentimes have the controller thinking that the hard drive had died, and then the RAID would basically break. Mm -hmm. um, similar technologies are error recovery control on Seagate, the command completion time limit, uh, which is the name that Samsung and Hitachi uses. And i got to be honest with you right now, I'm kind of irritated with Western Digital deciding to charge you considerably more for a RAID quality hard drive um, and disabling or, or basically disabling your ability to turn this on. The truth is, is that it, it doesn't really matter that much because hardware controllers are the ones that are primarily affected by TLER, especially the cheap ass zero and one rate controllers on motherboards um, compared to software systems such as FreeNAS, free especially running ZFS. Can you tell I spent a lot of time researching this week? Yes, I was freaking yeah, out about, no, that's like, good. You know, <laughs> FreeNAS, Unraid, um, um, and some of the, especially like FreeNAS with like ZFS and stuff where they kind of take over the situation. So you talked to Alan and he said he ran an eight RAID, eight drive RAID five of one terabyte caviar greens for three months, a 10 drive RAID six of one, tab, one terabyte caviar greens for three plus months, a six drive RAID five of two terabyte caviar greens for one month. And, you know, because basically they turned off the ability to turn off or turn on, turn off to user control of TLER um, back in October 2009. And he says he has not had a single drop out of any of these. He also right. points out that Drobo packages are units with caviar greens, not RE4s, as do nearly all of the NAS manufacturers. I can't think of a consumer NAS manufacturer using RE4s, actually. So... <laughs> So it, it, what's yeah. he actually? So for for his configurations there, I'm pretty sure he's using an Arica uh, RAID card, which is a fairly high end nice. hardware RAID card. So that you know that comes into comes into effect. Um, he says that he attributes most dropouts to cheesy RAID cards. So you know those those promised chipsets integrated on motherboards and those types of things, just like you said, and or flaky SATA cables. Apparently, this is a problem that not a lot of people think of that SATA cables mm -hmm. that that come loose that feel like they're in but might not be or they're not making a, a connection enough right. um and i you know i've replaced cables on them and, and and fixed problems which is one of those things that you just well it, usually with like digital cables you just think it's plugged in it's working no no worries about that sata plus hot glue gun equals stable connection by the way just make <laughs> right. sure you don't get hot glue down in between the copper pins on the sata uh, connector uh, on on your board and and the sata uh cable itself <laughs> right um so yeah that yeah. i mean we'll, we'll kind of i guess tler I'm, i don't think we'll 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 say that it's over for now but um that should be that should be good for those of you that are really really worried about uh, using caviar greens, maybe don't be as worried as we might have let you uh, feel a couple yeah. of weeks ago. So uh, we got an email here from Cameron about hybrid hard drives and setting up partitions. He says, hey, guys, love the show. 
I have a question about setting up partitions on a hybrid solid, a hybrid SSD or HHD like the Seagate Momentus XT. What I want to do is set up a very light Linux partition just in the 4 gig SSD drive to allow for ultra quick booting. Then set up the main hard drive for standard Windows 7 install. Is this hmm. possible to do? If so, how can I go about doing it? Uh, if not, could you recommend a budget-friendly laptop SSD? I thought um, the whole point. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. No, I, was say, I thought the whole point of the hybrid disk drive was that you had system memory kind of acting like a, or the, 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 the memory on the hard drive was acting like a giant cache. It wasn't a separate drive from the hard drive. Am you I are wrong correct. about that one? Okay. Um, <laughs> like, I, I love the idea, what you're Catherine, trying to do but, is not possible. So you, right. you don't get to access the four gigs of, of flash memory on there as if it were storage. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically, instead of having a 32 meg cache, on a hard drive, now you have a four gigabyte cache. And the benefits that provides are, are sometimes substantial on frequently accessed files, your operating system files, your application files. You know, those things are stored there, not permanently. It's, it's just like acting like a cache or anything else. But if they are there, then you get the speed up of SSD performance or near SSD performance. But if it's not there, it goes and reads it from the regular drive, copies it to the flash as it reads it out to you. So. Um, what you're trying to do, not possible. It, it shows up as just one drive. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you know, part, and even if you decide, I'm going to partition the first four gigabytes, um, that's, that's, not, that's not how it's going to work for you. Right. Um, as for budget-friendly laptop SSDs, I mean, really go to Newegg or go to Amazon and, and look for, um, you know, OCZ or Corsair. Uh, those brands tend to have lower-cost IndyLinks controllers. That you can get, you know, 100 gigabyte, 80 gigabyte SSDs for pretty cheap, 160, you know, that something like that. And there's a whole host of it. You go to pcper.com/ssd, you can get like a, what do we call it, uh, uh, an SSD uh, Rolodex or or a decoder ring where it kind of details <laughs> all the different uh, uh, drive manufacturers and what controllers they use and all that kind of stuff. You can get a little bit more detail there. Nice. Sorry, I was uh, I was checking the pricing on something uh, for an email from Horse about switch options. He says, I'm planning out my home network. I want it to be gigabit with future proofing. Excellent. As such, I am going to be running Cat6, Cat6 cable, also excellent. It says, I plans on two ports in each room, which may be overkill, but I still like it. So around 18 to 24 ports total. What switch would you recommend buying to handle this? I hear all kinds of things like buy one with no plastic, make sure it has fans. But outside mm -hmm. of that, information seems pretty poor for for the home networker if the device isn't integrated into a popular wireless router, which usually maxes out at four ports. Heck, does an 18 to 24 port switch with a wireless AP even exist for a home network? Um, okay, first of all, the nice thing about a switch, right, is a, uh, a hub is, is a bunch of dumb ethernet ports and anything that hits one of the hubs basically gets bounced to all of the hubs. A switch mm -hmm. does intelligent uh, switching of packets, so it doesn't send mm -hmm. it to all of the packets, which keeps you from ending up with giant packet storms on every node of the network every time you send a piece of information or make a request from a server or you're transferring a video, it basically reduces network congestion. This is all good. The nice thing about switches is you can plug a switch into a switch, unless I've got this horribly wrong, in which case we'll get a bunch of emails from system engineers. <laughs> <laughs> from sysadmins next week. Um, but basically, you know, you can take your, you know, you can take the, the gigabit router and plug a your gigabit switch into it and it will handle all the switching from hither and yon. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would suggest unless you actually need 24 ports, you might want to get a smaller router. Um, before I say that, though, I will, I will send you to uh, smallnetworkbuilder.com, mm -hmm. which is... In, in my opinion, um, doing the best, whoops, smallnetbuilder.com. It's kind of funny. I'm on this site like every other week, and I still think of it as network and not net. Smallnetbuilder.com, um, which is a pretty amazing website for consumer and small business um, networking. Uh, they are one of the last cool. places doing really extensive te test, uh, testing in, of uh, wireless routers. Um, they do NAS boxes. They talk about security. They've got some amazing how-to guides if you're setting up a network. I really can't recommend it strongly enough. Um, I'm a big fan of Netgear's uh, switches. 
and they've got some yep. pretty reasonably priced ones. Um, you're not going to find a 24 port, you know, <laughs> gigabit Ethernet switch with a router built into it. You're basically going to plug your router into I, the gigabit switch or vice versa. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I think it makes sense to not do that, not even try to look for it. Uh, separate your router from the, from the switch. That way, if, if you want to upgrade routers to 802.11, whatever, you're not looking yeah. at, a, at a, as much of an expense. I mean, you can get a, a, a Netgear 24-port gigabit rack-mountable uh, switch for mm -hmm. you know, $190 to $200, right. uh, which seems pretty reasonable to me uh, for something that's going to be that fast. Yeah, the the issue with plastic versus steel, I don't really, I I I I think it's a non-issue because I've I've seen a lot of plastic and some pretty expensive uh, server racks. Um, mm -hmm. Your bigger issue is whether or not um, is basically keeping an eye. If you stuff everything in a closet and you have a server in that closet, the amount of yeah. heat coming off of the server, um, depending on the CPU you're using, you can you can basically create your very own personal easy bake oven out of a closet in your home if you stuff two computers <laughs> in there uh, uh, yeah i don't think a lot of the switches will be affected but you may find yourself needing to do things like creating ventilation or adding a fan into that room that pulls cool air from outside of the room or at least sucks the hot air out of the top of that closet uh, mm -hmm. out into the rest of the house if it's in the basement it's less of an issue there's lots of free airflow um one of the things I've, I'm actually thinking about dropping into my home network is Netgear does their ProSafe routers, um, or I should say their ProSafe switches, which integrate uh, VPN, which means I could do a VPN login to my home network um, from anywhere I am uh, and basically have a secure connection so I don't have to worry about people trying to grab my information while I'm on uh, a, a relatively public Wi-Fi device. Um, right. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big fan of the Netgear stuff right now, uh, especially uh, if you're thinking that. about buying a, uh, uh, an 802.11 N router, the WNDR 3700. Everybody knows bought one of those is super happy with it. The performance is solid and the uh, radios are working pretty well on those too. So. Would you call it, was it the WNDR 3700? I think that's exactly the, the one I have. Does that also have uh, like USB uh, storage support on there as well? I think it does. I think so. The Range Max dual band. Yeah. Yeah. So you, there's at least one model that has a USB port that you can plug an external hard drive into and make it a network, a network <laughs> drive. So not quite a not quite a Drobo or NAS or anything like that, but still pretty no. good. So. It's it's a nice convenient way to do some backup. So. Yep. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, the you know pro safes are pretty good. The net gear boxes are pretty good. And the truth is, is, is switches are I have, switches are the new hubs, and you know switches Usually and they hubs. They even still sell hubs, honestly. It's 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 getting really hard to find a hub, um, but but part of the reason I brought that up is 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 that it's kind of stone age technology. It's cheap. Everybody understands how it works, um, you know. And unless there's you know somebody out there with miserable performance that I haven't heard of, you're you're probably not going to be too unhappy with any brand of switch you get. Uh, <laughs> few video from Horse in a few weeks uh, telling me he bought the brand <laughs> X switch and it destroyed his life. So nah, nah, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we've got two emails here kind of in a row on a similar subject. Uh, first one comes from Mike about Crossfire and single GPU uh, upgrades. He says, I was wondering if I should upgrade to a new AMD 6870 from my Crossfire ATI 5770s. Is it worth it to upgrade? Are there any better AMD cards coming out soon? Would it be a noticeable upgrade? Also, I wrote in last time about Crossfire X not making much difference in some games and found out it wasn't supported in some titles like World of Warcraft or Starcraft. Does this mean it only uses the power of one GPU? Um, you'll find that in some cases, uh, GPUs or games won't scale well with Crossfire or SLI. Um, Crossfire in general tends to scale uh, less effectively than SLI does just in the, in the past year or so. The, and, and some games like StarCraft that are CPU bound, World of Warcraft, another game that tends to be CPU bound, adding another GPU isn't going to make a big difference. That's not necessarily ATI's fault or, or AMD or NVIDIA's fault. That's just kind of the way the, the, the dice fall in terms of what the developers focused on in terms of, of performance and, and graphics and that type of stuff. Specifically, going from a 6870 to 5770s, um, I would say a 6870 is going to be of similar performance level to a pair of 5770s, but then you're not going to have the headaches of... <laughs> multi-GPU compatibility. You're always going to get... The, th the thing I've always said about multi-GPUs versus single GPU, uh, with, for example, the GTX 580 is 
performs actually a little bit slower than a pair of GTX 460s in SLI, which is an interesting uh, kind of thing that we found in our testing uh, this week with the GTX 480. And, and it's, they're, they're, you know, they're 60 or $70 less expensive for the pair of GTX 460s. So that's noticeable, but you're always going to get all of the performance out of a single GPU. You don't have to wait for software updates. You don't have to wait for profile changes. You don't have to wait for new drivers to come out to take advantage of the performance. I mean, you still might get performance improvements in a driver with a single GPU, but there have been cases where, uh, like F1 2010, for example, is a game that performance didn't scale at all on SLI or Crossfire when it first came out. <clears throat> a new drivers came out within, you know, 30 days or something like that. It's 30, 60 days. And now we do have scaling from it, but with a single GPU, you don't, you know, you don't have a lot of those, a lot of those same types of, of headaches. So that that's kind of, you know, it's it always depends on your budget too. If you're going with a single 460 for for 200 bucks today, with the plan of upgrading to 200 dollars, and you don't want to, you know, save up all that money and spend all 400 or 450 at one time on a higher end card, you know, that's a different argument. So we're Sure. That's, that's why I would say, in general, I tend to lean towards the single GPU option. Good um, to hear. So, does that bring us to Mike D's question? Yeah. <laughs> with his Alienware Aurora ALX i7-950 with an AMD 5970 and a single display, he wants to upgrade to an iFinity with three displays. Would he benefit more from a second 5970 or holding out for the 6000 series dual GPU card that will eventually be out? I know I'm asking for a bit of speculation given that the newer card isn't out yet. Just not so confident on how well Crossfire scales to four GPUs. I realize I'll need to upgrade the PSU that is already in the budget. So, yeah, if, if you take what I said about going from one to two GPUs, uh, going from one to four, or actually two to four in this case, because the Radeon 5970 is already a dual GPU card. It's Crossfire on a single card. Mm -hmm. um, the 5970 by itself is still a great, great graphics card. It's actually faster than the GTX 580. Um, so I don't, there's not a whole lot of cases where I can think of where this, this guy would need to upgrade his graphics card for anything. However, if he feels like he needs to, I don't think adding another 5970 is going to be the best option because going from two to four, the, the uh, law of diminishing returns is going to come into play here where, you know, going from one to two, we saw some performance improvements, hence why the 5970 is a great card. Going in and adding a third or a fourth, you're not going to see near as much performance scaling as you did by going from one to two. Um, so if I were him, I would say I would wait. I would wait to see what the 6900 cards are going to come out with. Uh, if he goes to the website and reads about the 580, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he'll know what he's going to get there. Um, and he could get one 580 today. It's going to be about the same performance, maybe even a little bit less, but then he has the option to upgrade to two GPUs there. So then you get, you're going to get more scaling going from one to two than from two to four. It's, it's kind of a, a complicated answer. I would say at this point, you just you should probably just be waiting and seeing what happens before the end of the year. Yeah. So on a less speculative note, we've got Jan, who's looking for yeah. silent gaming PC options. He says, I had a discussion with a friend yesterday about his plans to buy a new box. And this is something I notice that happens a lot with serious gamers. He wants something silent, very silent, but of course capable of running an up-to-date shooter at 19 by 12. This is all very reasonable. And here's where the classic gamer moment is. Now he found a company that sells such machines, silent high-speed gaming machines. Jam was a bit suspicious though, because the 1.5 thousand pound machine, or excuse me, Euro machine, which is what, like 3,000 US, did not even mm -hmm. have a solid state drive. In a test I read how they ran the GPU fan, it was a constant and speed, causing the thing to run at the boiling point, throttling the GPU, so much for that. By the way, they had a 10,000 RPM drive in there, which is neither thermally efficient nor particularly quiet, even if you wrap yeah. it in a drive enclosure. Now, Jan's question, do you have a recommendation for brands or series of silent graphics cards with enough oomph to run modern games? It doesn't have to be passively cooled model, necessarily. I think the rest, like CPU, heat sinks, and power adapters is doable, but I don't know any serious graphics adapters that are silent. And I promise if you find harsh words, I will make him listen. No harsh words. <laughs> no harsh words. Um, but, yeah, it's it's the the GPU is hard. I mean, 
there are a lot of, of you know, sort of big, slow-moving fans on gigantic coolers that are, are pretty, like, 20 dB range for CPUs, um, mm-hmm. silent, P, or silent, silent uh, power supplies. Uh, are actually getting almost common. There's some better case designs doing smart things like putting all the the heat so it flows up through the case. Um, I'd almost rather build one than buy one. But what about a? I mean, what's going to be a fast, relatively quiet card? Are the new 5800s going to do that with with the new cooling devices on there, Ryan? Um, it's that's really tough. So I mean, I, I could I could make some recommendations of what would be quieter. Uh, mm-hmm. than most cards, but to go anywhere close to saying silent or near silent, right. especially while gaming, <laughs> none, none of the cards today that use that, that have standard fans on them are really built for that. The only thing um, is to look at water cooling at, the, at right. that point, right? That's I mean, true. I, you can get, uh, you know, high, if we're talking about high-end graphics cards here, you know, mid to high-end graphics cards, look at um, EVGA cells cards with already built with water blocks or you can if you already have one of their cards you can buy evga branded water fix cards you can get msi cells uh a, a gtx 480 hydrogen g-force is the name of it uh that has a, a really nice water block built onto it it's 600 hundred dollar graphics card still um that i mean you're not going to find passively cooled cards that are going to be at the 5700 or, right. or 460 level of performance or above. It's, it's, it's just not going to happen right now. Um, One of the things that is worth pointing out is, is these cards don't have to have the giant, sounds like a jet engine, fans running unless you're playing video games that are really taxing the GPU. You know, if you're, right. if you're browsing the web, if you're, you know, screwing around, you know, writing up homework, you know, running an Excel spreadsheet, you can set it up so that the fans throttle down on these or you can manually turn the fan down or you run a water cooling system that's going to be relatively unnoticeable compared to a, a, a fan running at full yeah. power. Because a lot of people are like, oh my God, this machine is so loud. But the reality is it only has to be loud when you're actually taxing the cpu and the gpu it'll still generate a lot of heat it'll just do yeah. it a lot quietly so <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll release that heat into your room very quietly i'm just looking at Newegg. the the, le- the highest performing card that's not 600 dollars that is passively cooled mm-hmm. is a power color uh, radeon hd 5750 which is a decent mid-range card uh, but you know if, if this guy is considered um, a hardened a high-end gamer, a hardcore gamer that that you know is looking at SSDs and all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure 5750 is going to be fast enough. I mean, he could do right. two of them in Crossfire, and those are still passive and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it looks like if he wants really silent, you start looking at water cooling options. I like water cooling. FrozenCPU.com. Um, even if you like want to yep. buy for a, a UK site, water C- uh, FrozenCPU.com is a great site to see what's available uh, in terms of water cooling devices, quieter CPU fans and stuff. Just one of my favorite places to shop for that stuff. Yep. Because uh, I buy almost everything else from New Egg. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you know, it's nice tiger. to mix things up, right? Uh, David writes in, following up on the rheumatoid arthritis computing uh, question. Hey guys, I'm writing in regards to last week's episode, last week's episode, Twitch 94, and the listener's question about the best netbook for her mother. My own mother has been suffering from severe rheumatoid arthritis for over two decades now, and has moderate deformation in her hands. Many everyday tasks have become impossible for her to perform. She's been using a Sony Vio for most of her computing tasks for the past few years, but has been doing more and more on her iPhone in the past year. I recently purchased an iPad for her to try out, and she loves it. It is much easier for her to navigate via the touch interface, and she now does almost all of her computing on the tablet. It is also easier for her to access content via the App Store. The two biggest drawbacks to her are the lack of a print feature. That's going to be fixed, and there's a hack for that. Uh, And weight. It is a little (laughs) heavy for her to use in certain positions, but it is lighter and more ergonomic for her than my HP Mini Note. Thanks for the great show. David. David, that is exactly the kind of information we were looking for. Thank you so much for sending that one in there. So... Um, so it turns out I've, the iPad might be good for that kind of stuff. You said they were fixing printing. Is that coming in an update, or is it only the hack you're talking about? Well, there's a 4.2, I believe, is actually going to implement some printing features for the iPad. Um, Did we ever get 4.0 me, on the iPad yet? Uh, no comments. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But yeah, mm. basically multitasking, printing, uh, and some other stuff are coming in iOS 4.2. Basically, 4.2 is going to be pushed out on all devices. Uh 
you know, I, 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 if, if I could figure out how Apple does their operating system upgrade <laughs> numbers, I'd probably be making a lot more money than I do. Oh, you'd be, oh absolutely, absolutely. You have the ECS contest winners, content do, contest winners. Do you have do the you, ECS contest winners? Uh, the winner of, of an ECS Black Series A890 GXM motherboard. This is an AMD AM3 socket uh, ready motherboard. It's got 890GX integrated graphics, uh, ready for Phenom 2, X4, X6 processors, all that goodness. Uh, the winner goes to uh, Rob Maxwell. Uh, his response, we are asking for what their upcoming hardware <laughs> upgrades were going to be. By the way, the, the winner was just picked randomly uh, through a number generator, and then we just decided to, to read their submission. He said, I love the show. Only found it around episode 66, but you guys have inspired me to build my first computer, replacing my current Socket 939 machine. I guess this keeps in vogue with your spate of old computer upgrade shows. I do a lot of minor <laughs> tech work for friends and family, but I've never built one from the case up. He awesome. wants to know if we can recommend uh, a card, a graphics card in the ATI for 200 bucks or so. Wants to connect two monitors and also an HDTV, HDTV for home theater use. Not much of a gamer, but would like to be able to game and, and do some Photoshop. Uh, looks like he wants three displays, two, what did he say? He said that, right? Two monitors and an HD, HD TV that falls perfectly into the AMD Ifinity, three graphics cards hooked up to your system. Um, you know, if you're not doing a, a, a much gaming, you know, get a, get a Radeon 6850, right? I mean, mm -hmm. those cards are 170 bucks, 160 bucks probably. Uh, you can connect three displays to them. But one caveat is you have to make sure you get, uh, if, if you've got existing monitors, I'm going to assume they're not DisplayPort, DisplayPort monitors, so you have to have one DisplayPort to DVI adapter. Uh, if you look at some of the cards, like Sapphire, I believe, maybe XFX, they will come with these adapters in the box, so you'll be able to hook up three displays to your graphics card right out of the box without a problem. Uh, and that's well under two hundred dollars. So I think that's I think that would be a good choice. Get all three of those displays working at one time, and uh, should not have any problems. Nice. I think it's going to wrap this edition of this week in computer hardware. Do us a favor: email us your questions, your comments, your suggestions. Twit, actually Twitch, T W I C H at Twit TV. You can find us both on Twitter, twittercom slash Norton for me, twittercom slash Ryan Shrout for Mr. Shrout, who is the founder and leader of PCPer.com. <laughs> what's coming up? I mean, nice. outside of the, the AMD stuff, what's coming up on PCPer next week? Uh, so we've got some more storage goodies coming up. Um, if you, do you like the idea of having a solid state drive in the size of a DIM module that actually plugs into a DIM slot hmm. on the motherboard to draw power? We've got something very, very interesting like that coming up. Uh, we've got, like we mentioned before, the, the, the upcoming APU testing will be up next week. Uh, and then I don't know exactly when we'll have the, the future AMD graphics cards and all that kind of stuff. That <laughs> might be next month but we've got there, i mean there's tons of stuff coming down the pipe here so keep checking back nice and where can we find you hd nation of course hdnation.tv and uh techzilla.com or vision3.com slash techzilla so I'm, yeah. I'm remembering these urls now awesome uh tkzilla.com <laughs> you can tell that the techzilla started a long time after pc per our, our url is a lot longer and it's spelled weird um boxy box <laughs> review coming up next week we thought we we're gonna have it in this week's show but our, uh, we didn't get our hands on a box of time and for hg nation i'm actually doing um uh, if if the screen shows up and i should probably go run down to fries and buy one just in case uh, i'm going to be installing a projector basically talking about what you need to do to install a projector a front projector in your home because Part of me, like, I'm in love with the Samsung 8000. It's one of the most beautiful mm. HDTVs I've ever seen. I think it's actually a better TV than their 9000. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to go for the gigantic 80-inch screen in the house and see whether or not that <laughs> overwhelms the living room and terrifies my neighbors. So. I want to see pictures. Uh, we got to see some pictures of that. So we record live every Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. Uh, my name is Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Twitch. Twitch.